Aloha y'all, Daniel Aaron here, your guide to vibrant living, and we are rolling into this month's theme on gurus. Are they saviors, saints, con men, villains? Hmm, many things we could say, many things we have said. This particular video though is gonna be juicy, exciting, and I'm gonna share with you some of what I know from experience, observation, research about a guru known as Osho, AKA Sri Bhagwan Rajneesh. At one point, his name changed from Sri Bhagwan Rajneesh to Osho. Now, you may know of Osho, you may have read books of his, little tidbit, he never wrote any books. He's got 50, 100, I don't know, tons of books out. How'd that happen? They were all transcribed from lectures. He was an orator. Above all, what he did was speak and share with people, and it was really powerful. So powerful that the US government, getting ahead of myself, we'll come back to that. Now, you may know of Osho, because you may have read about him. You may have watched the documentary, I think it was Netflix, that was called Wild Wild West. I think that was the title of it, about the ranch, um, a town basically that <clears throat> Osho and his disciples at the time started or took over, created a village, a community, an ashram in Oregon um, going back many years. Interesting, cool docu-series, I guess is more accurate, maybe nine episodes, seven, something like that. Um, worth watching, I would say, if you're interested in gurus and Osho, I like about the documentary that it presents quite a bit. It doesn't necessarily draw conclusions. It a little bit more asks questions and points out certain things and allows us to bring our perspective to it. Now, personally, I felt like it aired a little on the side of putting Osho down. And I'm not necessarily putting him up or putting him down here. That's just my observation about the documentary. Now, a little bit before we get to what happened at the ranch and the US government and what happened to Osho, <clears throat> here's my experience with Osho. When I was freshly awakened, freshly tuned in to, ooh, there's spirituality, ooh, there's a spiritual path. Um, oh, there was healing available for me. That was 1996 when I first went and lived at Omega Institute in upstate New York. Holistic Learning Center, New Age Summer Camp for Adults. Amazing experience. I was so open, fresh. I was like a kid in a, kid in a candy store exploring all these crazy new things to me from Zen meditation to yoga to African drumming to writing from the left side of the brain, you know, all kinds of amazing workshops there. And one that I was lucky enough to explore, actually it wasn't a workshop, it was a friend said, hey, you're driving this weekend? Yeah, I was driving a couple hour drive in my old uh, Volkswagen Jetta and uh, she's like here here's a tape for you and so I, tape cassette do you remember those anyway um, I put it in and it was a audio program not a program it was just a recording of Osho speaking about the Yoga Sutra I was brand new to yoga I'd taken like six classes at that point in my life I didn't know what the Yoga Sutra was but there was this really articulate very, uh, I'm not, <laughs> better I don't try and do it. Um, beautiful accent, very soft and sweet and took a little getting used to. Then I discovered like, wow, there's really something going on here with this guy. And he spoke about yoga. Later on, I learned what the Yoga Sutra was, studied it, read many different versions. And I was like, wow, he really had something powerful to say. And one of the things that landed for me from that original listening, which has stayed with me, and something that I've wrote about in my book, right? Um, <laughs> forgot the title of my own book, um, The Art of Spiritual Leadership, 40 Laws to Transform Your Life in and the World. And one of the laws I spoke about, rock bottom, right? And there's a Buddhist proverb that says, from the darkest mud, 
the most beautiful lotus flower grows. And what Osho said about the Yoga Sutra was only when someone hits rock bottom can yoga begin. Huh. Right, and I still didn't really know what yoga meant at that point, but he explained it and said, yoga meaning awakening, uniting with our true divine self, right? The big why yoga. That was a really powerful lesson for me. So, you know, I didn't really think that much about it. I had that experience with uh, listening to his discourse in the car. Life went on, happened to be five years later or so, I ended up going to and then later living at a center, ashram, university, addiction recovery center, it could be any of these things depending on one's approach, a place in Holland called Humaniversity, which was started by one of Osho's disciples, a dude by the name of Viresh. Denny Husan was his former name. Former drug addict, 14 years strung out on heroin in New York City, who got clean, became a therapist, went to India, found a guru, it was Osho, and it he, in his words, fell in love with Osho, which, if you've been with me on this uh, guru exploration, you know on some level means fell in love with himself, the, saw his own light reflected in the guru, and later on started this ashram in Holland. Well, I lived there for some time and ended up taking sannyas, which means I said, yes, I do devote myself, dedicate myself to this vision that Osho has laid out for the world. And what's the vision? It's one of love, joy, peace, freedom. Now, did everything Osho touch result in that? Not really. And if you watch that documentary, you'll see there were some things that went on at that ashram in Oregon at the ranch that were not too cool, I would say, right? I'm not going to go into details, though. Some stuff that was pretty nasty, which brings us back to the question, specifically in this case, well, how aware was Osho of that? How much involvement did he have? Or is he culpable? Is it his fault in some way because he allowed other people to do that? Good questions, right? One of my teachers used to say, you know, there's, there's, he didn't say it this way actually, I'm saying this, um, there's the pure original and the toxic derivative. It often goes this way, something bright, pure, beautiful, and then it sort of iterates downward and becomes sullied often because somebody's copying it or commoditizing it in the business world. You could look at various examples. This one might be a little uh, shocking to say, but Jesus, Jesus Christ, right? And certain forms of Christianity. You could look at it as in the cacao bean, raw, organic cacao, and then toxic derivative, ours and Mars and, Mars and M&M, you know, the candy bars that have the tiniest remnant of chocolate with all this other crap added in. So, the thing my uh, teacher used to say is, look at Jesus, even he was surrounded by 12 dodos. Now, well, that's an oversimplification and they might be even metaphoric, all those disciples. Still, it brings the question of, and this is my question to you, and perhaps this is where we shall leave it, is the leader responsible for all that happens? Is the leader responsible for the disciples, the lieutenants? It's a juicy question. And as tempted as I am to <clears throat> respond to my own question, I'd rather hear from you or at least hear from you first, and then I'll share my feeling and thoughts around that. So, what is the leader or the guru's level of responsibility for what ensues, what comes after? And with that, y'all, again, I would love to hear you. Please comment, tell me your response to that question, and also, what's your experience with gurus in general? What's your experience with Osho? What do you know that I don't know? Very much indeed, I am aware. And specifically around this topic, I would love to hear you. And with that, I bid you adieu for now.
Aloha.